Neo Before Blog presents Neo Before Pod. Internet, the current frontier. These are the voyages of the website Neo Before Blog. It's continuing mission to explore strange new shows, to seek out conversations about nerdy obsessions, to have discussions that many have had before. Greetings listeners, happy birthday Star Trek. On September 8th 2016, Star Trek turns 50 years old, and how could such a milestone go by without Neil Before Pod, the podcast that so far talks about little else, doing something to celebrate? I'm your host Craig McKenzie, and over the next few episodes, myself and a brave band of officers will take you through the highs and lows of the franchise. This was all recorded in one night, but the discussion went on so long that I decided to make it more episodic. So without further ado, I'll activate spoiler alert to warn people against spoilers for a 50 year old franchise. Now, to beam in the bridge crew. And welcome aboard. Hello. Hey. Hello from the US, because you guys are all on the other side of the pond. We sure are. But the transporter has brought us all together. Where are my shoes? (laughs) Only lost your shoes this time. That's. uh, I'm getting better at this. Yeah, so um, I guess we'll just start with with introductions. Um, everybody knows everybody, but the internet doesn't know everybody. So uh, who wants to start with introducing themselves? I mean, I'm I'm Craig, your host, which you heard in the introduction. I'm Sa- I'm Sandy, also known as Alexander Richardson. Yes, yep, indeed. <laughs> I'm Alec Peters of Axnar in the over in uh, Los Angeles, California. I am Nick Cook. Uh, I'm in Dundee, Scotland. And here we go. So we're here to talk about something we all we all love, uh, Star Trek, which is turning fifty or has already turned fifty, depending on when you're listening to this. That's so, talking about Star Wars. Oh dear, no, so that's um, that podcast all, in the other room, mate. There's always one. Um, Doctor Smith. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the <Yeah>. pain! <laughs> there's always someone that can't read the signs. Yes, yeah, that's it. You assuming so, I can read? <laughs> well, you are from Dundee. Ooh. Uh, uh, I was from Dundee. <laughs> I'm from London. <laughs> I don't know if that's worse. Okay. <laughs> anyway, onwards. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the first agenda item is we all love Star Trek, but why do we love Star Trek? Uh, what does it mean to to all of us? I mean, for me, I've been watching ever since I was. Probably before I was born, to be honest, and um, I've loved it ever since. I've stuck with it through the thick and the thin, through the good, the bad, and uh, it's always there when I want to watch something that I enjoy. Basically. Yeah, I, 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 I grew up on it. I'm I, I'm kind of old, so I was actually alive when it was first on TV in 1966, and I was six years old, um, and uh, and I, I've been hooked ever since. Watched it in reruns. Uh, when it was in syndication here in the United States, you know, would watch every episode a dozen times. Um, and, uh, and ever since then, I've just been interested in it. I got involved uh, collecting Star Trek props and costumes at 10 years ago at the, uh, 50, the 40th anniversary of Star Trek auction that Christie's had. And, uh, that became a big part of my life and started a company called prop works, which is a big auction house of Star Trek props and costumes and of course, then I started Axnar and uh, came out with Prelude to Axnar and promptly got ourselves sued. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm probably unique among Star Trek fans in that I'm being sued by CBS and Paramount. Never a dull moment around you. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why you love me. Yep. Oh, that that was a that was a really good summary. Um, who's next? 
next. Sandy, you oh. go next. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, I was introduced to Star Trek uh, after I was introduced to Star Wars. I know that's a bit of a bit of a bit of a thing around about Star Trek fans, but hey, I yeah, was. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, there we go. See. See, there we go. Death to the infidel. Um, <laughs> I was actually introduced to Star Trek uh, one evening uh, after we uh, ha- were having a family meal. My mum switched over the channel. We just got um, cable, and there was the original series on on Sky One. Well, actually, it was just called the Sky Channel at the time. Well, that's how far back it goes. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, mum, just turn this off. I don't like it. I watched it, though, because I had- didn't have control of the remote control, and I've been hooked ever since. I uh, really liked the next generation from the from the get go. Um, I've liked all of. I just like. I just like Trek. I even liked. And if you've listened to the other podcasts, I even liked the 2009 and Into Darkness Trek films on their own. Maybe not solid Star Trek, but they were okay. Cool. And Nick, last but by no means least. Well, I'm not quite as old as Alec. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm old enough to remember watching the animated series first run on the BBC, and I can remember playing Captain Kirk at a birthday party at the ripe old age of about five, six maybe, when I lived in Bridlington in the mid seventies. So yeah, I'm I'm catching up on Alec. It has to be said. So yeah, I mean, I've I've been a fan all my life, and um, you know, it's hard to kind of put a finger on one particular thing that I like about Star Trek. Uh, It's just given me a lot of pleasure over the years, and I enjoy the stories, and I enjoy the morality play aspect of it. And, uh, you know, I think it's people make fun of science fiction, but I think there's a lot of compelling drama in there. And there's also some good humor and exciting stories and a bit of action and stuff like that. I, I, I just like it a lot. And it's probably contributed more to forming my worldview than probably many other things that probably should have informed my worldview. That's probably <laughs> why I'm quite as liberal as I am. Who knows? But yeah, I, I've always loved Star Trek as far back as I can remember. It's, um, yeah. yeah. So we're all in similar boats there then in terms of uh, how long we've been involved. Well, in terms of our lifespan, at least not in terms of the number of years of that life. But yeah. Uh, so as we're here to celebrate it, uh, it has its good and its bad. So uh, we're going to go through all of the various series, except from the animated series, because people don't seem to know it that well. Um, I certainly don't. And Sandy said that he doesn't. So um, <laughs> there we go. Obviously, it all started with the original series, Captain Kirk and his crew. And um, I'll kick it off with my favourite original series episode, uh, which is the season one episode, Balance of Terror. And it has... Kirk and crew's first encounter with the Romulans, and it's very much a cat and mouse game, as if it's a submarine battle between Kirk and the, the Romulan commander, who is every bit his equal in terms of skill. Uh, really tense battles, um, shows the difficult parts of command when one of Kirk's crew dies and he has to officiate at their funeral. There's even a bit of self-doubt for him. And it's just it's just a great, well-put-together, tense episode. And I absolutely love it. Good choice. Yeah, very good choice. That was on my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, duplications will not be tolerated. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I mean, I've, I could talk about it for hours, but I won't. Uh, I just, I think it's great. It's a good character piece. It's a good action piece. Uh, it just shows what the show is capable of in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I can't disagree. It's a great episode. Um, I, I would go. My favorite episode is Doomsday Machine. And Mm. uh, interestingly, it wasn't my favorite episode until about two, three years ago when I started watching a lot of, I started watching the remastered uh, TOS, uh, you know, in in HD. And and I love the remastered. I love all the new effects and everything. And Doomsday Machine especially uh, benefits from the new uh, special effects. Um, There's all so much in that episode that is visual, that is effects, and obviously the new ones are significantly better. So I really like that. Plus, it's a it's a great study in command. You've got William Wyndham's amazing portrayal of Matt Deckard, uh, uh, Decker, and, um, uh, you know, he's just brilliant. His 
his uh, his little callbacks with the data tapes to Captain Quig and the Kane Mutiny is just it goes over the head of most Trek fans. But if you uh, if you've ever seen the Kane Mutiny and why haven't you? If you haven't, uh, <laughs> it's one of the great uh, American uh, uh, actually a play first and, and now and then a movie with Humphrey Bogart and uh, uh, Jose Farrar and Van Johnson and and Fred McMurray. It's great, just a great movie. So um, I love that it's shot beautifully. It looks fantastic in the remastered. Um, you get just great Spock and McCoy stuff. Uh, Scotty being the miracle worker. Um, you know Kirk. You know I love it. You know uh, I love Kirk's. Uh, uh, what are you doing with my ship? You know and. Um, and of course, Spock's Vulcans never bluff. Uh, no, I don't suppose they do. Uh, <laughs> so it's just there's so much goodness in that in in that episode. So that's why it's my favorite. Yeah, it was a, it's a great episode. It was it was high on my list, and it was a tough call. But I'm glad I went with Balance of Terror because it came up anyway. Um, so Sandy, do you want to go next? Okay, mine is uh, the Devil in the Dark. Purely because one, it's one of the first episodes I remember seeing, and it had me absolutely, it had me mesmerized. I don't know why. It's just someone in a in a, a underneath a blanket hustling along, <laughs> but it's still good. I mean, it's it, you've got the whole thing. It's trying to communicate with them, and it's being misunderstood. You've got uh, uh, Kirk and Cole getting only one side of the story, but then slowly learning actually there's more to this, and you've got one of McCoy's best lines. <laughs> in the entire series, I'm beginning to think I can cure a rainy day. You know, uh, it's oh, it's not. I, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. That's <laughs> well, there, there's that one as well. Yes, I forgot. Actually, I completely forgot about that uh, cut. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I just like how it's uh, they they learn that you shouldn't you shouldn't always uh, take one person's uh, uh, side of the argument. You should always try and find the other side as well and make the proper decision with all the information to hand. And that's, uh, that's a, 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 I think that's a lesson a lot of people uh, need to um, listen to right now. And it's quintessential Star Trek. Yes, yes exactly. It is, that, that is the quintessential Star Trek episode. And who could forget the uh, delivery of pain yelled by Spock? Pain! Oh, of course, <laughs> and the no kill eye. Yeah, oh, it's a classic. Uh -huh. yeah. Great choice, great choice. Well, it's interesting that you chose that one, because I chose almost the flip side of that, and I chose Man Trap. Similar wow! Session. Ah! Completely fascinating different. choice. <laughs> I'll tell you, Man Trap is not, in the way they resolve it, a quintessential Star Trek episode, and it, it hasn't... It's still in that kind of raw stage, and they haven't quite got to that stage where they're kind of trying to figure themselves out, and they've not quite got to that point where actually we're better than this, and we're looking at both sides of the story. In Man Trap, they really don't look at the other side of the story, and the ending is really quite uncomfortable in that you could have saved this creature, and it's the last of its kind. Right. Hmm. But it's also that there's a melancholy collier to that ending that I really like but also the main reason I really like it A it's the first episode that aired um, despite the fact that they're still kind of, it's not the first episode shot but the first episode aired they're still kind of finding their feet but they're in their characters the characters are so much there at this point and there's a I, I, I very vocally my, my favourite part of the original series is probably about the first 10 episodes after that I don't think it ever had the same quite tone and feel as those first 10 episodes. But Man Trap kind of embodies all that kind of tone and feeling that the early first season had. That I really like that feeling that they are out on the frontier, that they are exploring, that they are encountering amazing things. Interestingly, there's a little bit of that tone that I feel to the new movies as well, which in some ways they don't hit the mark, but in some ways I think they almost find that tone. So I like the sense of unknown about Mantrap, this archaeological mission, which I, I find quite intriguing as well, and the interplay between the characters. And we're even getting backstory on these characters at this earlier stage. And it, it's just it's a lovely episode. Not so keen on the way it ends, because I would have liked to see them do the right thing. But at the same time, how human is it to see them do the wrong thing? 
Whereas later on, we're so obsessed with seeing how perfect these staff the officers are and how they always do the right thing to actually see them do the wrong thing, but kind of for the right reasons, but kind of not for the right reasons. There's a rawness and a realness to that that I kind of like. And I, I just love the tone of it and the feel of it. It's a very, it feels like they're on an, they're in an alien world. And I, I just really like that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, wow, you made a hell of a case for that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Also, isn't it interesting that the first person to meet up with an old girlfriend is McCoy and not Kirk? Yeah. <laughs> but then they yeah. Still that's a good point. At that point, and they hadn't really got to that. St- I mean, it's it's much later on that you find that you well, not much later, but certainly a good bit later on, before we get into the Kirk's this slightly womanizing Kirk. I mean, in the first, Kirk is very different in that first half of the first season. He's not yeah. got the same brashness and that same cowboy thing about him. He's much more, he's much closer to Pike than the Kirk we get to know later. He's That's not, a really good point. That's a really good point. He's certainly closer to that hmm. idea of the captain that we see in the cage as opposed to the Kirk we're getting in, for instance, Doomsday Machine, where obviously at that point Shatner settles into the role and we've got this kind of cowboy, slightly rebellious character, but hadn't really developed at that stage. Yeah, I suppose by that point they were writing for Shatner rather than just writing mm-hmm. Kirk. Well, I, I, I like that Kirk, and again, that's one of the things I like about the earlier episodes of the first season, that there is that kind of rawness and it feels very fresh, and yeah, I just like that. So yeah, yes. Man Trap, definitely. Mm. Loads of ones I could have picked, but Man Trap's probably one I go back and rewatch more than ever because of that. It, they feel like they're on the frontier. They feel like they're exploring. They feel like they're out there on their own. Hmm. Great case for that. Uh, so, unfortunately, they, they can't all be great. Uh, yeah. so, so we'll move on to the, the less than great episodes. And, uh, Alec, if you would like to kick us off with your least favourite episode of the original series. Wow. Um, I, I know this is going to be the cheap way out, but it's got to be Spock's brain. Uh, <laughs> got out I mean, of the it's just, <laughs> really, it's just, you know, I, I, unfortunately, it's one that I, I remember the most, too. It's like, oh, even as a kid, I was like, they took out his brain. That's kind of dumb. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I just... Um, although I will say the redeeming thing is the scene at the end when McCoy is working on, on to you know put his brain back in his head, and uh, and he starts to lose the 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 you know the knowledge. I, that was kind of interesting. Uh, it, it's a good point for McCoy, but uh, yeah, I you know just Spock's brain. It's like come on, uh, the overall cheese level is just a little little much to handle. Standard season three, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, that. Go- that's universally known as the worst episode, or one of them anyway. Uh, a lot so, of them for me. Yeah. So, uh, Sandy, Let's what one did you dislike? Anything with Harcourt Fenton mud. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know what it is about the man. It, it's cheese. It just, it's so cheese. It's Gorgonzola. Mm. I just, I don't like him. I, so I which, really which mud episode specifically? Uh, it'd have to be Mud's Women. Uh, I really can't say. It's, it's very hard for me to say exactly why, because I, I don't like to hate on things as such, uh, especially when it comes to Star Trek. Um, it's, it's just the overacting. Mm. Oh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm no offense to uh, what was it, Roger Carmel, who did Harry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, oh, no. um, I mean, no offense to him, but I just think uh, Harcourt was always just over the top and a l- just too risky and double entendre. I think maybe that's what I just don't. Do, I just don't get go down with that. That's that's what it is. It's hard to tell why I don't like it. It's just you know when you see, you see something and you've you've watched it a couple of times and you just go you just go no, just <laughs> no. That's that's. I can't really give a good explanation. I really wish I could. It's just, you know, I can't. I really want, I really want to see you cosplay Harry Mudd now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the body figure for it. <laughs> or well, Cyrano Jones, go for him. But... <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I can see why people wouldn't like Mudd. Um, I guess he's a bit of a Marmite character. I don't mind him personally. but I like Mudd. Yeah. 
Uh, he doesn't appear that often, so there's that. Uh, so, Nick, what's your least favourite? Okay. Yeah, I, I find it very hard to pick a least favourite because there's episodes I really like and then there's episodes I'm kind of mediocre about. But uh, I probably have to say... I'm going to say Plato's stepchildren. Hmm. Uh, it's just terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> it's... Oh, my... Oh, it's... Ter- you know what? It's got one notable thing about it. It's got that whole interracial kiss thing that we make so much about. Hey, good for that. Well done. It's a terrible episode. It's just... Oh, I... We've got you going now. Really, <laughs> acting from Shatner is dreadful. And Shatner's up and down. You know, sometimes he's good, sometimes he's hammy. He's particularly hammy in this. And just, ugh, you know, the magical mineral that gives them super telekinetic powers. And <laughs> I can't argue with you there. It's awful. It's awful. <laughs> It's a low point of the series. And to be fair, season three had a lot of low points. This is a particular low point. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. It's uh, it's not especially good. Um, for me, I would have to go with the season one episode, The Alternative Factor. I just think it's dreadful. I like um, it! I whoa! Like it. And I'll tell <laughs> you why I like it. A, well, part of it was filled with Vasquez Rocks, and I love Vasquez Rocks. And I love when they get <laughs> off the ship. That's that's a big thing to me, when they get off and on planets that love that. But that last scene on the bridge, A, Shatner's really good in it, and there's just a, there's just a nice tone to that. And what of Lazarus? What of La- I, 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 there's just something about that that I like. I realise it's probably, it, I'm aware it's high on everybody's least favourite list, but I actually quite like it. Yeah, for me, the story was all over the place. It doesn't really go anywhere. Um, I don't disagree at all. It is. all that interesting. Lazarus was really annoying, and... And, and those changing. common those common interludes where he's fighting himself and they they've got you you've got that weird camera filter that just shows them um, color flipped or whatever and they're just they're just pushing each other around it's just corny you know it's it's not something I would show to anyone to say hey you should watch Star Trek all very fair points and I don't disagree with <laughs> any of them. I still like it <laughs> oh well I can't get past this funny silly looking improbable looking spaceship. <laughs> thing is, it could have been interesting because you had this whole parallel universe thing, you know, that obviously will become important in later shows. But I think the first time they did parallel universes as well. Yeah, and that was how they did it. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, um, I agree. It's not a strong episode, but there's just something about it I've always liked. And it may not even be my least favorite, but it's the one I think about when I think of bad episodes of Star Trek. So it went on there. Um, so yeah, so we've uh, gotten through the original series. Um, some good some good choices in there, and I'll be sure to write them up in the show notes. But now we move on, 80 years or so, to the next generation with Captain Jean-Luc Picard and his crew um, sitting in their beige bridge, flying around the galaxy, talking at people. Uh, start off with the good. So, Nick, you want to go first? Absolutely. TN- I'll just preface this with, start this off with, when TNG came out, I mean, I was... Yeah, high, I was just starting university when TNG came out and I was a long time Star Trek fan and this idea of doing a Star Trek series without the original series cast I was not in, at all beyond, behind that at all I thought it was a terrible idea and right. I remember oh. many people did um, and funnily enough this happens every time there's some kind of new series or reboot or whatever but anyway um, I remember watching the pilot on video rental and thinking it was dreadful <laughs> dreadful. It was awful. And then I got a DV- another rental. I was about to say DVD, but it was video, VHS. Another <laughs> rental with another couple of episodes, and they were just awful. I remember thinking, this is the worst idea ever. I'm never watching this again. Jump ahead about a year or two, and um, somebody at university had, and this obviously how far back it was. We didn't have digital downloads or anything like that. People used to get bootleg videos. <laughs> and the guy at university had bootleg videos of season two and we're talking like about 10th generation copies they were terrible quality um i thought okay i'll give it a look and i started watching the second season and i kind of started getting into it actually this has gotten a lot better then i got to season three and i was like oh my god this show's amazing so i kind of gone full circuit and i kind of learned from that it's like you know what i'm never going to prejudge these things again i probably have but you know (laughs) i try to be a bit more open-minded 
Anyway, I went from a position where I hated the idea of TNG to TNG kind of became my favorite show out of all the shows. Anyway, favorite episode, season three, which is the definitive season of TNG for me. Who watches the watchers? Yes. Ah, good one. I could talk yep. about this for hours, but basically I'll sum it up. Again, they're off the ship. Funnily enough, Vasquez rocks again. Um, which is a great place to visit. I'd like to stress this. Um, anyway, they're off the ship. They go to rescue this personnel from the duck line that are monitoring this Bronze Age Vulcanoid civilization, and there's an accident, and someone goes missing, and they end up being seen by the natives on the planet. So they've got to. They end up with this whole Prime Directive mess that they have to kind of fix, where the natives think Picard's a god, and how did they get out of this? Uh, I'm sure Kirk would have blown up a computer or something to try and convince them but Picard says you know what I'm not I'm just gonna bring them up here explain the situation to them tell them what's what I'm not gonna like these people I'm not gonna give them fake commandments and pretend to be a god I'm just gonna tell them how it is they're not supposed to be here it's an accident we just know things you don't and that's what he does and the episode for me largely revolves around Picard's relation with Nuria who's the leader of the Mintakins and that really is what makes this episode for me. Because it's Ray like, Wise. No, 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 no. no. Is that Ray not Wise. him? The female. Um, I've forgotten her name at the moment. but um, Oh, the, the female. Theory. Yeah. Anyway, when he brings her to the ship and he shows her the ship and then he takes her to the, red, to the observation lounge and shows her her planet from space. and There's just a lovely feeling to that. One, season three is great because, again, it feels like they're out on the front end and they're actually exploring but this episode ties up so much of what I love about TNG. They, they make the right choices, but they don't force their choices. And they say, look, this is who we are. You have a right to develop in your own way, in your own time. You're amazing. Be you. Bye. They just connect on a visceral level. And I'm not explaining this very well now. And I think probably because I love this episode so much and I'm trying to get it all out. Basically, the scenes where Nuria gets to see her planet from space are just so, so lovely. And I think it's something that we can all relate to because I think most of us think if you put us up in space, this is something we would want to see. We would want to go to space. We would want to see a planet. Yep. It's you like know? Lillian, first contact. Yes. Yes. And I, but I also love the way Picard relates to them in Tarkins. He doesn't treat them as a bunch of primitives. He treats them as people. Right. He respects them. So much, you know, we so often don't respect other cultures on our own world. And in fact, even in our own countries. And the fact that Picard, who is centuries ahead of these people, treats them as equals and treats them as grown up enough to make their own decisions. And that had quite a strong impact on me in my early 20s. Um, yeah, so no, that's definitely my favourite episode. I'm going to stop talking now because I've gone on too long. But yeah, that's my favourite episode. Yeah, and I'll yeah, jump in. Nice. And let, let me jump in because I'm also a fan of season three because season two are, and one are so dreadful of TNG. Um, it's amazing we all got to season three. <laughs> but but um, my favourite episode uh, is Yesterday's Enterprise. That's correct. Uh, yep. It, yeah. Which is simply just mind by. Well, first of all, we have alternate universe and then and time travel, and um, you know you have a, a dark militaristic future for the Federation, uh, where they're losing the war with the Klingons, and um, uh, and it's brilliant. And Guinan, you know, obviously we have Whoopi Gold, Goldberg came in as Guinan, and she's just this was her tour de force this episode. Um, this is where we learn uh, learn something interesting about Guinan, and um, she has that great scene in um, in the ready room with uh, in, the, in the in the briefing room with Picard, and uh, which is oh my god! It's just you're watching two brilliant actors just eat up this wonderful script in which Guinan is so sure of what the right thing is, and Picard is struggling. He does not know. I mean, he is so out of his element here. It's like, what time travel? What do we do with this ship? And, and, and the, you know, I'm sure there's a, he doesn't mention the temporal prime directive or anything. And, and she's telling him to do what is not what he wants to do. Not good enough, damn it. Not good enough. <laughs> I mean, it's just one of the great lines in, in Star Trek for me because, 
you know, it's wow. You see Picard and you're like, holy crap, he's really upset. And and Guinan just is in his face like it's going to, you know, I forgot her exact line, but she's basically like, it's going to have to be. You know, you just got to trust me here. And um, and so we also see so much without anything being said, everything about their relationship, a lot of which we learn later on in, in Star Trek, like in Time's Arrow and such, is right there. That he has so much faith in her. He, you know, um, so it's great. And, and plus we have the Enterprise C and we have great characters like Rachel Garrett, who, I, you know, uh, I kind of wanted to see her in charge of Voyager. And... Um, <laughs> And, and and Castillo, um, and you got Tasha Yar back, and and the way they then play that off later on in in uh, uh, in reunification, brilliant, brilliant. So anyway, yesterday's Enterprise. There you go. And who can forget the action beat where uh, Picard vaults over the tactical console to man the weapons? That's yeah, uh... Stuart loved doing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'll be the day. Yeah, that's it's just impressive. And Riker's death where the rocks appear from nowhere. I uh, yeah. <laughs> just watched that episode about a million times when it came out, actually. <laughs> Again, on a really bad bootleg copy. Mm. Uh, yeah. Boy, well, you and your bad bootleg copies. Well, listen, yeah. in, in the 90s, we we had to wait years before TNG would air here. I mean, literally years. Yep. And I mean, the only way to see it was to get bootleg copies from the States. And even wow. then, you could wait months because it would take weeks for it to come from... Of tapes that come over from the US. I mean, now someone can come in in a few days, but in then, weeks to send anything over. And like I say, there was no, there was no, there was internet, but not much. And we certainly didn't have the kind of downloads we have now. Um, now, if, you know, you know, the new sc- show's coming, we're going to get the day after the US on um, Netflix. Yeah. Well, isn't that, I was just about to say, so isn't that fascinating how yeah. things have changed in 30 years? Whereas it yeah. used to be that, you, and, and here's the beauty of it, it used to be that you would wait years to get it and had to get it on bad bootleg VHS tapes. Now, with Star Trek Beyond, <laughs> there are those of us in the U.S., I'm not saying I'm one of them, who are going to have to go and get Netflix International <laughs> <laughs> to, okay. In order to see it, who you know, people are like, well, I'm not paying five dollars a month. I'll just get Netflix Interna- International. Yeah, so I, uh, I think it's like we're coming to Uden this time to see the new Star Trek. I, I think that I think they kind of drop the ball on that uh, off on a tangent. I think they I think they should have just gone with Netflix in the first place. It, it just I don't know. It, I don't it, know. It, it, rem- yeah. it just feels like UPN all over again. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first time that Star Trek was used to try and kickstart some kind of other service. Yeah. Yeah, you yep. people did so well out of it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, great choice. And it's interesting that you say that season one and two are routinely awful because my favourite episode is actually a season two episode. Well, I it think me- some episodes in season yeah. two. Measure of a Man is my choice. Oh, uh, yes, yes. The episode where Data goes yeah, on right. trial to prove that he's yeah. a sentient being. God, everyone is talking about that. You know, in the last, like, 90 days... That episode has come up in conversation more. It's like, what happened? Did it just they just re-release it or something? Because everyone's talking about Measure of a Man lately. Possibly because Melinda Snodgrass just it just uh, sold a TV series with George R. 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 Martin. There we go. Oh. Yeah. So that so, might be why. Yeah, and the reason I like it so much, I think it's a it's a beautiful character piece that focuses on an issue that doesn't have a simple answer. You know, is data a living thing? Um, we all think he is because we know him, but. If you look at the facts, there's a bit of contention there. And the stakes are huge for Picard, who has to define life and apply it to data. And the stakes are equally large for Riker, who has to essentially betray his friend to um, argue against the fact that he's alive. But by doing that, he's actually honouring his friend, because if he doesn't, then someone else will be found and and all that stuff. Um, It has a great Guinan moment, where she uh, sums it all up for Picard uh, by liking it to slavery if everybody can if every, if every ship has an android you have generations of disposable people and it's a really powerful scene um, it's just a very well written episode all round and on the blu-ray there's an extended cut which is even better i think than the than the theatrical and than the tv cut i think it's just no, it's a great episode it sums up so many great issues has great acting all round it's just it's just a joy to watch well, it's funny you should mention season two because one of my B choices was a season two episode. Which we'll get to. <laughs> uh, so, Sandy, you're up last. Favourite TNG? 
Well, I'm a little bit f- further on. I think it's season four. Um, now, I've had to... I've got three really, really, really favourite TNG episodes. Um, it's really hard to choose one. Uh, but I'll have to say The Drumhead. Hmm, another um, court case episode. Yeah, it's a nice uh, conspiracy theory um, showing you the um, how sometimes if even the even the famous the people the people who have done much good can sometimes just be blinded by a hatred or some something that they just don't like and they just try and incriminate someone who's not really hasn't actually done anything wrong and uh, maybe it's because of recent events um but i just it just it just when i watched it the other day uh, it it just um, sunk to me. It just it hit me as a yeah, that just so much like what's going on these days. You've got trial by media where people are being um, they're being accused by uh, the the police of something, and the media go all, go all uh, hogwire and it's they, they they've tried and convicted them before the the person even gets to um, gets uh, to have their day in court, and that's much the same because Admiral Sati. She basically had, um, what's his name? The the the, the guy who lied. Please, that's him. She had him. She she was convinced he was it. Before he even had his uh, his his day in front of in front of a, a jury, uh, and then laying into Picard as well, but purely because he had the misfortune of being um, assimilated, and watching the, the the pain on Picard's face as she, as she you know, didn't, how do you sleep at night? And am I right in remembering she picks apart a lot of his decisions as well throughout the season? So there's continuity in there as well, which she is does. kind of rare back in those those days. Actually. She does, and then and then the way he gets her um, is by using her own father's um, uh, a quote from her own father, and that just tips her over the edge, and she just goes on a she just goes on a a, a rant, and the admiral that's looking that's pre- watching over the proceedings walks out. Hmm. And that's it. End of. Uh, that's it. The end. Uh, end of the whole. The whole thing. And it just shows you how someone who has done a lot of good can be corrupt if if they have the right uh, motivation. It is a good episode. I always wanted to see more of Simon Tassi's to see where he went from there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I thought uh, he he could he could have become a could have easily have become a, a recurring regular. He could mm. have been. It was a yeah. That's a really good episode, and it's interesting. Now it's one of the the money saving bottle episodes, but the they made such a good, um, you know, the, a good go of it that it's just one of the classics here. Yeah. yeah, nice also, choice. Also, also, Worf being able to um, uh, lay the smack down in, in, in private. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> it's brilliant. Without being an incompetent for once. Yeah, yeah well, mm, without getting thrown across the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, great choices, everybody. Uh, such good episodes. Uh, we'll move on to the, the lesser of the TNG episodes and Alec, if you want to go first. Yeah. My, I, my least favorite TNG episode is going to be skin of evil first <laughs> season where Tasha dies. I just, Oh my God. I just, there is so much that I can't stand about that episode. Of course, Tasha dying. I thought was bad because I thought she had a lot of potential, which hmm. we see later on. Um, uh, and I thought she had a lot of, I, I thought the backstory they came up with her too was really interesting, and I wanted to see more of that. So cutting her off so early, I just was like, oh, you know, I, I know Denise Crosby probably felt she had a, a, a future in movies, but, um, yeah, that that was a real bummer for, for me. And then just this this creature was like, oh, God, would the art department not have a budget that week? And, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, the black goo and, uh, uh, I don't know, I just not a fan of that episode and uh, – Again, first, listen, the first and second season of Star Trek The Next Generation are basically bad 80s sci-fi. They are basically a couple years separated from Glenn Larson's Buck Rogers. It, <laughs> it, is, ju- it is not – it is a valiant attempt, but unfortunately, you know, and a lot of that – blame me if you must, but a lot of that is Gene Roddenberry's fault uh, and, and the control he had. You know, the whole we're in a happy, happy, joy, joy future where there's no – Drama. Uh, every everyone's so evolved that there's no drama. Uh, no, there's no conflict between characters. Well, that's a lack of drama. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> no conflict. Everyone's nice. Uh, no one has problems. I mean, it's, come on. The utopian future just didn't work. So it wasn't uh, you know, until they made some changes in season three. And then we started, look, look how many season three episodes we think are great. Um, and, yeah. of course, measures of a man is an exception. But So anyway, Skin of Evil, my choice for worst Star Trek e- episode. Yeah, yeah. And the haphazard killing of a, a main character, that's... Just, you, you imagine oh. that being done now, you know, on television. It's, a, it's crazy. Right. I mean, it's like, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you mean the haphazard killing. As far as I'm aware, Denise Crosby wanted out. She didn't see her character going anywhere. She just right. said, write me out. Yeah, and they did. Yeah. <laughs> you're hit once and then you're gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It has one saving. That episode has one saving grace. The funeral scene is actually really nicely done. Yes, it's very touching. Yeah, it is. I agree. Most of it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, a definite good choice for the bad. Uh, for me, I would say Code of Honor, another season one episode. Oh, uh, that was Yar, my... God yeah. damn you! <laughs> <laughs> Yar being kidnapped by an African tribe race uh, is basically the best way you can describe it. Can I uh, speak? It's equal parts yeah. racist and sexist. It's <laughs> it makes no apologies for it. The story isn't interesting. And wait, 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 wait. Does oh. that so that episode is basically the autobiography of Donald Trump? <laughs> oh, <No. laughs> oh, topical. He'll come after us. <laughs> well, he won't. But yeah, he'll stop, um, he'll stop me. Hey, he'll stop me from getting in. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the story isn't interesting at all, and it has that really sanctimonious, holier-than-thou attitude that early TNG had, you know, where we're so much better than you, and we're going to show you how much better than we, it, it, than we are. It's very guilty of that, yeah. 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 So yeah. it's it's painful to watch, and I can't watch it. You know, if I was to re-watch TNG, I'd probably skip it. It, it, is, adds just, nothing. it, is, best, it is definitely an episode that I would go skip. Uh, yeah. If I'm channel hopping and I see it, usually if I see if I see Star Trek listed when I'm channel hopping, I'll go, "Oh, what's that?" And then I'll go, and then if I see that, I'll go, "No, skip." <laughs> cool. Well, that that was my offering. Um, it's a, that's about as bad as it gets for TNG for me. Uh, Sandy, do you want to go next? Sub Rosa. Guy, you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, okay. Hang on. Let, let's just be fair to Nick. I'll, I'll, no, I'll, no, I'll, no, uh, no, 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 no. I'll I've actually. Got one other, you're fine. Oh, okay, fair enough. Sub Rosa, it's just slow. It's just done, not engaging. Again, it's another one that I'll just go, eh, skip. Um, it's just, I mean, I know it's a, it's a nice Gates McFadden uh, episode. You know, it's a nice little family history of the uh, 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 of Crusher and stuff like that. But it's. It's just um, no. What horrible, is it about if people racist, can't remember, like me? It's a horrible racist um, Hollywood view of Scotland. Yeah, it's the Scottish ghost one, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> her, is it her great aunt or something like that that dies? Yeah. I keep she, her, oh, it I turns keep, out Crusher is Scottish, and we hear about that in the seventh season. Okay. She inexplicably <laughs> decides to spend some time in her great aunt's house instead of beaming back up and going on her merry way and shagging her ghostly boyfriend. Yes. Well, it's you know, been a while. I, I don't blame her if she's get if, if if someone offers. Well, was, was the last before that not Riker when he was a trill? Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's a that's such a bad episode. I forgot it existed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I half expect to see Greyfriars Bobby appear in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, Nick, now that we've stolen all your choices, what are you left with? Okay, I am going to say, funnily enough, it's Frost Season episode, Naked Man. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. reasons why. TOS remake slash sequel. It's a TOS remake, which is a bad idea for a start. But also, it's just bad. It's bad. There's like... I, can't even, I, I don't even have anything to say about it. It's just bad. <laughs> well, there's, it has one saving grace. I'm fully functional. Oh, God. Yeah, that was cheesy as hell. The whole oh, Yar seduces Data. Really, really, that was just cringeworthy. The thing that always bothered me about it is it's the, only the second episode, and they've got everyone acting out of character already. And Data's or and Data becomes a sentient dildo. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I wanted to. Um, I see. I don't. How did they? Um, how do they uh, um, explain that he gets infected as well? Oh, because yeah, it 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 
it does. He sweats or something. Is yeah. it weak? Is it weak sauce or something? It, 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 it's it's crap. It's some bullshit techno babble. I can't even remember. But it's just a bad episode. Uh, you know, they right, clearly right. didn't have a lot of ideas. Let's do a call back to the original series and do it really badly because they took an episode in the original series that was pretty good and made it into a TNG episode that was really bad. Yeah, you get no <laughs> argument from me on that. Uh, that noise was Alec leaving us briefly to switch to his phone. Yeah. So hopefully he will return shortly. No more, pa- no more it, power it, typing. It was, yes. it was woeful. Yeah, no, you're getting no argument with, with me on that one. Yeah, it's not as woeful as Sub Rosa, though. Well, mm. it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was a, it was for me, it was a switch up between Menage a Trois and Sub Rosa because Menage, uh, Menage a Trois oh, is okay, but I don't mind the comedy episodes. Yeah, I just Luxana is grating on me. Luxana is oh. the TNG equivalent of Harry Mudd, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, she she grates on me. I mean. And- no, no, no offense to uh, uh, to Majel uh, Ronberry, but because she, she 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 nails it, she's meant to be irritating, and she's meant to be over the top, and she does it well. It is just great on me. Interestingly, talking of Waxana, they gave her one really, really good straight episode in season seven, Dark Page. Yes, and that's a pretty amazing story. The one with Kirsten Dunst. Yep. Yep. Only. Yeah, so uh, that that you know that's 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 an excellent, beautifully written and beautifully acted and directed episode, uh, mm. which considering Lex Arnaz in it is, <laughs> is an amaze, always amazes me. Because uh, uh, she's not actually too she's not too offensive in that one actually. You, you, uh, I, I will admit. I, I must admit, anything with her in the first couple of seasons, I find pretty much unwatchable. Man, <laughs> dreadful. Although it does have the great Shakespeare. Manhunt mm-hmm. probably Picard. should be on my list of episodes, of worst episodes, because it's dreadful. And I can't Haven from the first season, which is when you first meet her. That is awful. In fact, actually, you know what? That's worse than Naked Now. That is a terrible, terrible episode. <laughs> <laughs> Nick managed to sneak two in there. There's impressive. nothing redeeming about what happened <laughs> in that episode either. Yeah. You know, later episodes... There's there's more to her, but and she's just an irritating character. And again, when she turns up in Manhunt, she's annoying. Did, did I open, did I open a floodgate here? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> she she oh. later on it's different because she gets more depth as a character. She becomes more than just as anno- the annoying mother. But certainly those first couple of episodes, it's just painful to watch. Hmm. Yeah. So um, before before Nick explodes, we should move on to. Deep Space Nine. And to be continued. That was the first part of our series of podcasts on Star Trek's 50th anniversary. We hope you enjoyed and we'll be back for our next part where we continue boldly going through the highs and lows of the franchise. A special thank you to YouTube channel 331ERock for the music you've heard here. As always, please do subscribe on iTunes or any major podcasting app and join us on the next Neil Before podcast.